Hello, everybody. Here's the course proposal, because uh, you are invited to the Open Research Institute MATLAB and FPGA training. This is proposed for May 2023 on the internet. And we need your feedback. So here's the, the proposal uh, after um, uh, an amount of work uh, between MathWorks and, and Open Research Institute on, on what we think our volunteers might need in order to step forward and produce some and implement some, some of our designs that we've been looking at and to better support the open source community. So the course proposal, so this is over four days total, but you'll see three days listed. The third day, since it's hardware centric, is split over two days. Day one is preparing Simulink models for HDL, or hardware descriptive language code generation. And that's kind of the heart of what we're after, is to get to HDL and FPGA implementations through MATLAB and Simulink as quickly as possible. There's a toolbox called HDL Coder, and that is the focus of this particular training, how to use it, how to prepare your models and your MATLAB um, scripts uh, for, for the best possible outcome from HDL Coder. And so on day one, we start off with preparing a Simulink model for HDL code generation. We're going to generate the HDL code. And this is human readable. In my experiences so far, the, the quality of the HDL code that's produced by HDL Coder Toolbox is excellent. And it also can produce a test bench at the same time. Now, we'll start off for a simple model that doesn't really need a lot of optimization. And you can see here, these are the kind of the bullet points of the first hour. We move on to fixed point precision control. This establishes a correspondence between the generated HDL code and that specific Simulink blocks that you used in your model. And this is using the fixed point tool to finalize the fixed point architecture of the model. So this is scaling and inheritance and designer workflow and all of the things that you see here. So that's estimated to take about two hours. Now, this is one of those things that our particular community might not need to spend the entire two hours on. So I'd like your feedback on this, whether or not we need this. And then we move right into optimizing the generated HDL code. And this is a four hour segment um, where we use pipelines to meet the design timing requirements. Uh, this is where we use specific hardware implementations. And we're looking at all of the different optimizations that are available to us, including area. So. That's kind of like the meat of the, the, the second part of day one. After you've digested all of that, day two is signal flow graph or SVG techniques and high speed, uh, this is finite input impulse response or FIR filter design. So we're gonna go over representation of DSP algorithms using a signal flow graph using the cut set method to improve timing performance and implement parallel and serial FIR filters. Okay, so lots and lots of filters. You can see some of the stuff, if you've never done filter design is gonna be very familiar and using pipelining and multi-channel architectures and the topology that's kind of like um, sort of a, a bread and butter thing in, um, in Simulink. And then this last thing is important. So what, FIR filter structures are most appropriate for FPGAs. We continue on with something that we are, are very interested in, multi-rate signal processing for FPGAs. This is four hours. This is polyphase filter techniques and polyphase structures and multi-rate filter design. So upsampling, interpolation filters, downsampling and decimation filters, the arithmetic involved, integrators, differentiators, half band, moving average comb filters, and the cas cascade integrator comb filter. And then efficient arithmetic for, um, for IIR filtering. That's a lot. We also have this in here, it's the cordic techniques and channelizers. And this is cordic algorithms. This is primarily addressing trig functions trigonometric functions. Um, there's rotations and vectors, cosines and sines, 
a lot of us may already be familiar with this, so I'd really like feedback if you want to spend two hours on this to go over it. Um, you know, or if there's somebody out there who's like, wow, I would totally take this class because it has this. I need to hear from, from both of you so that we can have uh, the best possible weighing and considering of this particular course outline. All right, day three. Now we're going to move into actually programming Xilinx Zinc system on chips with MATLAB and Simulink. And we're approaching this from the point of view of a software-defined radio implementation. So the first thing to kind of address is like exactly how you deploy the IP cores. We're relatively familiar with this as a, as a community. We've been able to, to accomplish this, but there is in this particular toolbox from HDL Coder, the way that you accomplish the work is through the workflow advisor. And this class will help you how to configure your simulating model, how to generate and build the HDL and C code deploy to a Zinc platform. Zinc in particular from Xilinx, which is what we're using in remote labs. You can see from the bullet points, there's a lot of stuff going on here. How do you configure your sub subsystems for the programmable logic fabric? How do you target the interface? How do you handle peripherals? Um, generating the IP core and integrating with the SDK, I think we, we got this. This is the uh, IP uh, publishing or IP generation packaging process. Um, and there's a, 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 pretty, a pretty good process or workflow from Vivado um, we've had relatively little difficulty using it. Um, but then building and deploying your FPGA bitstream, how do you get the software interface model? And then how do you tune parameters from the outside? So some of this we have had trouble with, figuring out how to get the, the general purpose processing part or the, the application processor to properly communicate with and handle the bitstream. Um, one of the problems that we've had is with uh, buffer timeouts on the transmitter. So day three continues, and it's called model communication system using Simulink. So what this is, is looking at the 809361. This is the, the chip that's on the Pluto, uh, you know, just in, in particular, this, this number here. If you see the 9361, that means the, the analog device is Pluto. And this is to model and understand a transceiver using Simulink. So you're going to simulate a communication system that includes a transmitter, transceiver, channel, and receiver, and implement the radio I.O. Um, and so if you've played around with the Pluto within an FPGA context, a lot of this is going to be very familiar and like, yeah, yeah, that's that's right. The This particular training approaches it from a MATLAB and Simulink perspective. So you're going to verify the operation of the baseband transceiver using real data compared with I I'm going I anticipate compared with something that you would be also be generate to be able to generate from your model. So we are interested in verification and validation here, and this class is is going to get at some of the tools to let you do that in a, a formal way. There's system objects. That's a thing in MATLAB, having these various system objects. You make the system object, then you call the system object almost like a function. And we've used these for the modulators, demodulators, forward error correction, uh, and other things. So being able to use these and get them into a bitstream, that sounds exciting to me. That would be useful. Um, and setting it up as a, a front end for over the air signal capture. So it doesn't work until it's tested. And we really care about over the air stuff. So the third day gets into over the air stuff and actually working on hardware. So you can see that the rest, including like uh, configuring the registers and filters with the system object um, and verifying um, real versus simulated data. Something that MATLAB and Simulink and uh, heavily relies upon when it comes to uh, sort of the Xilinx and, and uh, analog devices world is uh, Live I.O., which is what we've been using all along. We've been using it primarily with uh, Petalinux. Uh, so it will not be a big difference here. Um, you know, if you're familiar with Live I.O., that is what is relied upon by MathWorks and MATLAB and Simulink to communicate with these transceivers. This goes on to prototype development or deployment, 
with real-time data using a hardware software code design. That's the next two hours. And it's how to generate the HDL and C code targeting the programmable logic PL and process the system PS on the Zinc SOC to implement a transceiver. This is what we've been working at and implementing and making progress with, with, as we said, Pad Linux from uh, Vivado and an open source uh, work. So there's an overview of the co-design workflow and implementing it using this workflow, configuring the software interface model, which is a big deal because a lot of the magic and all of the user interface and user experience come from the software side. Um, and then downloading generated code to an ARM processor. And then this is kind of interesting, tuning the system parameters in real-time operation via Simulink. That's that's cool. So what we're talking about here is sort of the system in the loop or FPGA in the loop where, okay, now you're going to make sure that your system works the way you intended and um, and setting up a, a big outer loop to test these things. Uh, and then finally, letting go of all these loops and deploying a standalone system. The proposed class date, the first date that we can get from MathWorks is the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th of May, 2023. Now, when we talked yesterday, um, they were thinking the first two days would be the theory part and all of the stuff that's actually on a platform, you'd log in in the class, you would be logging in to their remote lab um, and it would be the, the third and fourth day. So this proposed class date, two through four may actually be two, three, and four and five, the fourth with the fourth and fifth spread out four hours on the fourth and four hours on the fifth. But the, the written proposal that I got is only the second through the fourth with all of the hardware on uh, the that third day. Now this may work for a lot of us who are okay with the fire hose approach, um, but I would really like some feedback here and, and I will absolutely take that all back to MathWorks. If we want this date, if we think this is great for us, then we need to confirm to back to them by the 4th of April, pay for everybody, at least 10 people by the 12th of April. The class would run 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. with seven hours of content. There's breaks worked in there. And we have not yet talked about time zone. So we got to weigh and consider this proposed outline. There, This is a, a class that is... Um, pulled from four different MATLAB paid classes. And all the material, the outlines for all those four classes is is on Slack, it's been on Slack for a while. Um, so if you have not read over the class material, and if you see problems with this particular outline, then please uh, log on to Slack and tell us what you think might need to be swipped and swapped. If it's okay, if we have enough people, at least 10 people, then we can proceed to go ahead and offer this class. So what are the costs? This is um, $5,000 per day for up to 10 attendees. And it's $350 per day after that. They max out at 15, that's the absolute maximum. But since this is, has some hardware centric approach and it has you logging in, more than 12 is really hard. So we're looking at really 10 to 12. All right, so what do we need? We need students. If you want to learn this stuff, you want to learn this workflow, you want to help implement these complex open source designs using this workflow, then this is for you. If you want to, it can also help you in a career path. You can say, I am formally trained in this. It will improve you and your your interests in your career and your engineering vocation in many ways. Uh, but if you're interested in taking this training, please get in touch. Even if the dates don't work out for you, even if it's like, wow, I, you know, I, I can't afford uh, whatever it divides out to be per person. We need to hear from you because we need to know if this is uh, something that people are interested in. And especially if you think this is way too advanced. So we would like to help you get up to this level uh, a lot of the presentation of this material is not great. It's just not great. So much of it really makes sense and is absolutely lovely. Um, there's never been a better time to do radio work. 
and it's uh, with cheap computing and cheap gain and decreasing prices for microwave gear, this should be much more accessible to uh, open source, amateur radio, uh, digital communications folks at, at all levels. Um, so we're here to help with this. This is part of our mission. We also need some some help financially. This would be great to be subsidized. If you are, if you can subsidize it, if you can pay for it yourself fully, great, please do. Uh, if you know of a foundation that might be interested in in helping this class happen, uh, if you're a company and you would like this training for your employees, we are here to coordinate with you. I'm going to try to spread the word as wide as I can, but no, there's nothing that beats word of mouth from all the people listening to this. So if this class looks good, then let us know and help people attend from your company or your organization. In order to get in touch with us directly, uh, the people that are you know, trying to help this happen, then you can write us an email at hello at openresearch.institute. And that will, that will be fantastic. We'd love to hear from you. Feedback of any, any type. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share. And thank you so much for, um, for tuning in and listening to that. Uh, so we'll move on to uh, reports from remote labs and on FPGA uh, design and work that's been going on over the past week. Uh, for those of you just joining us, this is the uh, stand-up meeting. So what we do is we talk about what we've done over the past week and what we are doing over the next week, what we have planned or what our intention is, uh, whether or not we need any resources in order to do our job and if we have any roadblocks that are in the way. So I will now uh, turn the floor over to Paul. Hello, Michelle. Um, Remote Lab news is uh, there's only, it's only one thing to report in Remote Lab, which is that our uh, our new radio has arrived at the uh, post office box. We'll probably collect that today and maybe get it set up over the next few days. And be able to use the uh, AD nine thousand two. Is that the right? ADRV 9002, is that the right number? That's exactly right. Yes, it's an ADRV 9002 from Analog Devices. It will go on to the ZCU 106, and that's an UltraScale Plus from uh, Xilinx, and it's available for anyone to use doing open source work. Right, what she said. Um, and otherwise, the remote lab is hanging in there as uh, as it has been for a while now. Your remote lab was. I don't know any of the news from real land south if there is any oh just a little bit little update um james is uh was not able to join us today he's the lead for remote lab south so he has some um, uh, uh, other things that he had to do today but he gives a big thumbs up and says things are moving forward and we look forward to um to having some some photographs video pictures from the physical plant development at remote lab south Okay, very good. In other work, we've been uh, making incremental progress on opulent voice. But it doesn't really tie into either one of these things just yet. Well, it will eventually because we'd like to deploy all of this to the um, the essentially the the transponder, so Hyperaria with with you know our uh, Geo and Heo open source uh, transponder. This will be the receive side and the transmit on the ground. So if, you, if you'd like to talk a little bit about that, it'd be a, a good time to do it. Well, okay. Um, I was working on getting the, a transmitter running on a standalone device like a Raspberry Pi uh, without need for any external help, like a GNU Radio Flow Graph running on a powerful laptop, which is how we've been demoing it in the past. And I got to the point where I needed something to you know, test against. So I sort of on the back burner for the moment and, and switched over, switched back really to the C++ implementation, which is a converted version of the M17 C++ version using, uh, using the computer to run the modulator as one program and the demodulator as a separate program. Um, Converting that over from the the demo version of Opulent Voice, which was free of any 
protocol overhead to speak of to a, a version that would actually work in the world uh, with uh, standardized protocols layered above the opus vocoder. This means increasing the sample rate uh, in order to accommodate the overhead. And that means changing a bunch of things, uh, interleavers and filters and uh, constants that are here and there in the code, uh, trying to get that all a little more parameterized than it was before and uh, working again at the higher rate. Um, and the first attempt uh, did not work at all. It wouldn't even detect the data carrier reliably. So that's been fixed and moving forward to the next thing, which is something that's always been broken in the demo code, um, the detection of sync words, which is, it works, but doesn't always work. It's one of those unreliable things. I expect to find some dumb mistake, but I haven't found it yet. Um, and then move on to the next thing, which will be, um, well, whatever, whatever doesn't work after that, I guess. Uh, this is not rocket science, <laughs> literally or figuratively, uh, but it does require a fair amount of chipping away at. And uh, especially for me, I'm not a C++ expert, so the C++ stuff is somewhat baffling from time to time. So that's where we are in that. That's progress that we can make incrementally. Uh, start to see uh, some waveforms coming out and maybe even hear voices coming out the other end before too much longer. Yeah, no, it's been uh, uh, quite the the journey and uh, a really wonderful process. So I'm I'm happy to report that the the forward error correction and the interleaver combo that we have is ideal. So it's it's uh, the best you can get uh, according to theory, and and it's all. Uh, in good shape. So it's a big step forward and, and we have a lot of confidence in that particular part. Uh, and the work on the uh, what is a, essentially a data carrier detect uh, was was another really cool learning experience. It's like it all it all sort of makes sense. So it's a I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to explain the uh, the improvements and and the the sort of in a way, it's sort of a simplification because this particular protocol, Opulent Voice, is um, both simpler and more complicated than a lot of other uh, digital digital voice systems. So the the addition of all these other layers, you know, IP and UDP and RTP, they are they're adding a lot of overhead, but they make the end product uh, incredibly useful. And it should make it uh, make a lot of the stuff very transparent, and also delivering very high definition voice. So you know, 16 kilobits per second is uh, quite good, as you demonstrated in your Ham Expo talk from six months ago. So we'll just continue to do this, and the the team working on it, all the people that have contributed and answered questions, and you know, and in your efforts are very appreciated. It'll. Uh, Whatever we have uh, will be demonstrated in uh, August at uh, DEF CON in Las Vegas. I'm looking forward to that very much. And uh, you know, if you're if you're there, please join us in RF Village. All right. Any last uh, comments or or anything from from the lab that you need? Nothing at this time. All right. Cool. Well, I I look forward to. I'm going to do a, a show for uh, the, the new board to kind of highlight the differences between the ADRV 9002 and the ADRV 9371, and to point out the differences between the baseboard, to bring attention to the resource that we have, and to get people, uh, you know, if you if you want to use these and would like to code for it, then uh, we, we, have, we have your back. So that'll be coming out later this week. All right, I think we're good. Thank you, everybody. This has been a wonderful sort of report to give. There's a lot going on, and we look forward to hearing your feedback about the class and the new resources at Remote Lab. And see you again next week.